Um, so today I'm going to introduce our moderator for this panel. Um, Shaniqua Shirayer is a mission driv driven marketer with a passion for storytelling and amplifying diverse voices. She specializes in social media, email marketing, website development, and content strategy. In her role as digital marketing manager at Facebook, she leads marketing efforts for the education modernization team. Through her work, she also drives brand awareness and helps increase access to innovative K through 12 STEM programming. I wanna give a huge thank you to Shaniqua for joining us and leading this panel. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to start our event today. Thank you, Shaniqua, and thank you to all of our panelists. Awesome, thank you so much, Michelle, for that amazing introduction and also for the opportunity to moderate this panel. I'm really excited to kick it off. Um, so yes, we have a great panel of talented, some of the most brightest minds in social media and marketing here for you all today. So I'm gonna start with some introductions. Um, so maybe Amanda, if you wanna kick us off. Sure, hi everybody. My name is Amanda Savercool. I'm the Director of Social Media at uh, UCLA Strategic Communication. So that's managing all the at UCLA, as we call them, brand channels and working in close collaboration with our various partners across campus managing their own social media channels. And um, yeah, my previous work uh, involved social media, marketing, PR, journalism, you name it, and uh, found my way into social media. And the field itself has changed quite a bit over time. So I'm happy to be here and speak with you all. Thank you. And we kind of do popcorn style from here. So anyone sure. else want to jump in? Let's go to all popcorn. Yeah, to Bria since she unmuted. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Everyone. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Bria Deans. Um, I'm a brand marketing coordinator at NBC Universal, working on the E and Bravo brand. So basically what I do is manage all of the marketing campaigns from conception to completion um, for all of the, the programming. Um, and I've been working there for about three years, um, right after graduating from UCLA. Go Bruins. Yeah. Awesome. Great to have an alum. Um, how about Tyler next? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Tyler Dimich. Uh, I'm a senior manager of social media at ESPN. Um, and I've been at ESPN for almost 10 years, which is crazy. Uh, I graduated from UCLA in 2011, and it was my first like full-time job out of college. So um, definitely wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't go to UCLA. Um, and I oversee daily content production and operations um, across a number of ESPN brands and um, social platforms, specifically Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Amazing. Loving all the alum energy on the panel. All right. How about Melissa? Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. Awesome. We're good. So I am Melissa and I am probably the furthest from UCLA. I'm in Sydney, Australia. So it's 6 a.m. for me, FYI. Um, and fun fact, I'm allergic to popcorn, but I'll play the game. So I am the CEO of Career Outcomes Matter and I've been career coaching individuals since 2011. I'm not gonna think about how young or old anyone was on this particular event. But it's been a wild ride. It's always been virtual. So Zoom for me, Skype before that was something very common. And I'm also the host of an interview with Melissa Lorena. So I've had the most amazing guests, including some names you might know of, like Gary V, um, also the ex-CMO of GE, Beth Comstock, uh, the creator of Poopery, Susie Batiste. So all these individuals have really shared their stories with me and I would welcome anyone to definitely tune in should you be interested in hearing about how all these amazing people have done their sort of career journey their own ways. So thank you for having me here. And yes, NYU undergrad. So understanding I am in Bruins land. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us all the way from Sydney and getting up early for this panel. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. And then, yeah, Michelle, if you want to help close us out with introductions. 
Hi there, Michelle Harrow. I am Global uh, Director of Talent Acquisition at uh, Strategy and Operations at Twitter. Um, I've actually been in the social media space uh, actually only a year. Uh, previously, I was over at Apple. So it's been very interesting to transition from a company who's actually created devices that have really enabled uh, social media and now move into um, this space to really help Twitter grow. Uh, really excited to be here and hopefully can be of help to you all. Amazing, thank you, Michelle. All right, so we're going to jump right into our questions. So the first question that I have for the panel, um, obviously we know that we've had quite the year um, dealing with like a pandemic. There's a lot of shifts that we've seen in social media, marketing, and the tech space. So what are some of the biggest shifts in social media engagement and strategy that you've seen in the past year? And maybe Amanda, you can start us. Sure, I'd love to. Um, yeah, so I think the biggest shift is, I think we've gone from awareness as being the goal with social media to a more targeted approach of uh, providing value. It used to be that um, brands thought, okay, we need to be on social, we need to get our message out. And what I think is so important today is that social media, we all are bought in, we all know it, its use and its value in many different ways, depending on your goal and your target audience. But I think what shifted so much is um, that we, instead of pushing out, uh, we are looking to pull in. And when I say pull in, that's like, you know, from a cultural standpoint, right? It's not just about pushing our messages onto people via another platform. It's about providing value at the end of the day, providing value and demonstrating impact. Otherwise, there's so much out there, people don't really care to hear your message. And so um, I guess I could elaborate quickly to say, like when I say provide value, I think our minds first go to um, like a coupon or you know something like that. And that, that can also be something we see on social. But for me, as you know, I'm not selling a product at uh, UCLA, although some might argue I'm selling a product in the sense of like a lifestyle, right? We're a lifestyle brand. And so um, when I say provide value, I mean like, you know, we can provide insight into like a hot button topic or um, a, inform a discussion, save people the time Googling, right? Um, so they trust UCLA as not being, you know, it's the fake news. And so, we can provide value and that we can break down a complicated issue or subject. We can help people look smart at a dinner party. We can you know, generate pride in an accolade. And so I think um, giving people something that they can brag about so they don't have to feel like they're bragging about themselves. You know, there are all kinds of ways that we can provide value. But I think that the most important piece right now is that we're meeting people in culture and with our brand promise, our value promise, somewhere in the middle, instead of just trying to like get as many eyeballs on our stuff as possible. Yeah, I love that response. I think one of the good things that we saw come out of the pandemic in this past year, like a lot of people are just looking for, like you said, that value and like that integrity in the brands are not just looking for you know the superficial things that maybe before we were, but we really had to reevaluate what's important for us as consumers and really just like hone in on that. So I love that response. Does anyone else want to chime in on that question? Sure. Um, I think for my brand, the biggest um, obstacle that we often try to hurdle is converting social media audiences to broadcast network audiences. And the biggest um, thing that we've noticed over the past year is the rise of TikTok. It's completely shifted how people interact with content. Um, Instagram, you know, it's obviously not going anywhere, but I think that it just has shifted how people interact overall with content, short form. Videos are um, a main source of marketing now, more so than, than still imagery. So I think that's just been the overall shift in terms of our overall strategy. Yeah, if I can piggyback off of what Bria said, because ESPN's goal or like largely has a similar, you know, conundrum of like a broadcast audience transitioning to a, uh, trans or how to convert the social audience into a broadcast audience as well as engage them um, directly. 
in addition to like Gen Z and TikTok and just the explosive growth on that platform in the last year, that was like one of the two things that I had noted um, when I saw the question. And the other is um, audio and like Clubhouse and Twitter Spaces. Um, Facebook is now integrating audio rooms and the ability to you know, interact and listen and sit in a room and be a fly on the wall for conversations that you previously weren't able to be a part of. Um, so that's a very new and kind of like unfolding strategic direction that we're not really sure where it'll be in a year, but it's happening. If I can just quickly add, I wanted to just make a suggestion for anyone listening and watching. So what might be really helpful is for you to write down some of the language that you're hearing amongst the different panelists, because that language is going to be important when you are interviewing in the future or at any point. So understanding that you're speaking the same language, broadcast, all these words, they're important. So really write them down. I know I'm a nerd, but I thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> no, I appreciate that, Melissa. Thank you. And yes, definitely write down all of these great tidbits that you're getting from the panelists. Um, and yeah, and also like, as you know, you can put questions in the chat for us or comments in there, and we'll be able to hopefully have time at the end to address them. But yeah, thank you for that, Melissa. Hey, a uh, next question. So how have we seen social media and marketing professionals pivot during the pandemic to keep followers engaged in a new way? I know we talked about Clubhouse, talked about the rise of TikTok, but what are some other tactics um, that we have seen from professionals in the industry? And if you if you want to have um, maybe Tyler or Amanda try and start, start us off there. Yeah, I don't mind going. Um, so, I mean, I think in a sports social environment, uh, it, it, the question quickly became how are we engaging fans when there are no sports um and that our strategy was very quickly like okay we need to have content that's not time sensitive or reactive to live sporting events um evergreen content so we call that um or user generated content so a lot of our feeds our social feeds look like videos that fans were sending in or old videos of previous sporting events um, so that was like how we needed to stay engaged and tapped in and continuing to give our audience something that they cared about while they're sitting at home with on lockdown. Um, and then I think the pandemic really fueled the creator economy. And when you stress test content and people's ability to like engage with the world around them, um, it, it like the most creative like people who don't have kind of the external world to like play with and just have themselves, you know, in quarantine or wherever they are. It's like those creators kind of rose up, um, you know, in the TikTok landscape and in other platforms. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was one of the favorite things that I saw um, within social media. So just a lot of organic and authentic content coming from everyday users. Um, and really just a lot of talent just being pushed to the forefront that we probably would have not seen or noticed if it wasn't for people just kind of being, you know, at home and like just having the inspiration and time to be able to really put that into, you know, the social media universe and having us kind of all connect online in that way. So that's Shaniga, you just brought up an important thing, yeah. I think, too, which is that people, do, it, it became less glossy, right? Like I know that for social, it's evolved for us that it used to be you needed like a video crew and you needed, you know, you put all this thought and time and energy into all of the finer details to put out a product and then wait for the likes. And now I think the pandemic has, has shifted it so that it's almost like more authentic if people are showing up on TikTok, like not wearing makeup, like in their stretchy pants, like it's all good, like it's fine. We're all who we are now on social and on Zoom. And I think that reflected too in um, the creator content and the creator culture that we saw celebrated. <laughs> yeah, shout out to stretchy pants. Yes, stretchy pants and leggings were the saviors of the pandemic, <laughs> absolutely. Um, does anyone else want to chime in on this topic? I think also there was this desire for good news during that moment. 
So I think a shift in terms of the topic from let me get your attention to sell something to wait a minute, everyone needs to hear something good in their day was appreciated from a consumer perspective. It was something that, you know, I looked forward to watching and absorbing because obviously there's enough of negative stuff and uncertainty. So to balance that out, just kind of like, oh, every day there's going to be like Jim from the office popping up on YouTube, you know, with his good news stuff. That was something to look forward to. So I know I appreciated it from a, okay, wait a minute, what is it that people really need right now? I couldn't agree more. Yes, those were like my favorite content that come out. Just like the ones that just made you laugh. We all needed a laugh <laughs> because there was just a lot of going on to keep us down. But definitely those moments where someone would share like a funny cat video or just like <laughs> or another viral TikTok dance, like this moment you could just like have like lighthearted content that just like like Melissa made you feel good inside. So completely agree there. Um, so yeah, so what are some things that current students and recent alumni could be doing right now to prepare for a career in social media and marketing? We have some people on the panel um, that that's their current, current jobs are in talent acquisition. So maybe um, Michelle, you can kick us off and Melissa would love also love to hear your thoughts there. Sure. Um, yeah, I sort of think of it in, um, you know, two primary things you know, you can be doing. Um, uh, one is continuing to build um, education and a knowledge base um, in this space. And, you know, it's one thing to get, uh, you know, a formal education in it, but it's, this is such an evolving uh, space as well. So how do you really uh, keep up uh, with uh, trends uh, of where things are going? Um, and then I would also say just uh, on top of that is, um, you know, uh, as you're thinking about uh, where things are going and understanding where the trends are going, almost having an understanding uh, and knowledge around the emerging landscapes and and platforms of social media and marketing and what they're targeting. I think that was actually something that was really interesting when I came into this space. Um, hadn't really had a lot of sort of knowledge in it. And as I looked at just the entire sort of ecosystem of social media, they were really looking to target many different areas, audiences, uh, different sort of strategies and visions around what they were, they were trying to do. Um, and I also think Tyler kind of hit on this a little bit as well as, you know, what is this creator economy? Where, what is this concept of decentralization and where we are going? And what are these sort of underlying human psychology that's drawing this popularity or draw to sort of social media? So just sort of immersing yourself in, in sort of in that, in that knowledge so you can be, you know, essentially demonstrating that. And then the second aspect, aspect would be um, building a portfolio of work. And it doesn't have to be specific work that you've done. I mean, a lot, you know, you can like specific in the uh, social media or marketing space because a lot of things are, you know, transferable um, that you can, you know, essentially be able to uh, tie the dots to. But one thing that that will provide you with is uh, demonstrating um, that you have gained some skills and experience in this area, uh, being able to speak to the value and impact that you've made uh, in this space. And also just sort of your um, demonstrating your sort of um, sort of ambition uh, around really trying to sort of baseline and upskill yourself uh, in this area. I love those points. And I and just to add to some of those points, I wanted to say that when I think about the different podcast guests that I've interviewed and I look at them from their career trajectory, the one that comes to mind is the former CMO of GE, and she suggested that we every once in a while engage in what she calls the weird. So what's the weird? So GE, super traditional, you don't imagine them in any way getting value from going to like a Korea pop, like, you know, concert. However, Beth would go to South Korea and actually understand like the K-pop sort of trends. Um, all of that to say that chances are in your own personal lives, there are things that you do that right now might feel very unconventional, 
might feel odd. However, let's look five years from now, two years from now, they might actually be the key to actually getting consumers engaged in any brand like TikTok very weird. And so that's something that I want you to just think through when you're thinking about what you need to do today to be more valuable tomorrow. It's also looking at the areas of your life that might not be on your resume. So thinking through, is there something outside of what I do as a student, as a um, a student that's a parent, is there something that I do? Yeah, engage in the weird. I love the comment on the, on the chat. <clears throat> is there something that you do that could in some way or another, because it has your attention, catch the attention of someone else when it comes to the employer that you decide to work for? So that's one thing, just engage in the weird and really bring more of yourself to any employer. The other thing I would say is when it comes to this notion of inviting yourself. So let's say right now you're at UCLA and you're a major in whatever, let's just pick a major psychology. So invite yourself to, let's say a career conference virtual these days that is intended for neuroscience majors invite yourself. That's, a, that's how I got my first job working for Reuters. You know, I was the non-business student at a Stern NYU career center. So invite yourself. That's something that Nigel Parry, a celebrity photographer did when he was working in an agency, not doing photography, but he invited himself to display his portfolio to a senior leader. The senior leader didn't ask him that he even did, you know, photography. So invite yourself. And then the third thing I would say is, you know, know the assumptions coming in. So if you have a liberal arts background, as an example, and let's say you're looking at a job description and it says data, this data, that Excel, this, that blah, blah, blah. Just understand that there might be some assumptions on the other side of the virtual table that you might need to overcompensate for in other ways or address or fill in the own, your own skills gaps for. And the beauty is if you've never worked with Excel, go on YouTube, check it out. How do you do this like, you know, formula thingamajig, right? So in terms of being ex in terms of information access right now, you're in like a gold mine era. Like this is like out of control information. Now the key is for you to figure out what to do with that information so that it adds value to your own business case as an employee to one of these employers. And it's not a conversation only for someone that graduated from the business school. This is a conversation for everybody that is a student. Because in the words of Susie Batiste, the founder of Poopery, who was a guest on my podcast, your life is a masterpiece. It's your work of art. So you get to choose the colors, you get to choose the canvas, and you get to choose who gets to see your, your, your awesomeness. So be in agency of what it is that you want to add to your portfolio so that you have a portfolio and so that you feel good about all that effort that you've put into your, your life experience. Gosh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle and Melissa. So many great gems. I hope you all were taking notes <laughs> um, because those are some really great takeaways to keep in mind. Uh, I definitely resonate with a lot what was said, especially around just inviting yourself to the table. Um, that is literally how I ended up in my current role. I just looked for opportunities where I could just be like, hey, you need someone to write a blog? I know how to write. Can I do it? <laughs> hey, you need someone to run social media in the intern while we hire a social media manager? Let me do it. Let me try it out. And those little opportunities that you take advantage of can lead to your big break. So thank you so much for, for that wonderful advice. Um, I did see a question um, in the chat, which kind of like, what we're talking about right now about building a portfolio. So I wasn't sure um, Melissa or Michelle, anyone on the panel wants to talk about like, how do you build a good portfolio? I think I can start off just in terms of, um, you know, what that might look like. If this doesn't need to be anything necessarily, you know, formal. I mean, certainly if you have done um, some um, experience that you've actually had, you know, some type of job or some type of experience or a project in which, you have um, specifically um, 
um, you know, created a deliverable or output that you can demonstrate straight that ties to sort of social media that's one aspect of it the other is just simply demonstrating sort of your proactiveness you know in the space so whether or not that's um you have become a community leader for um a political campaign or uh you know things that are just um or simply or a, a, you know demonstrated a community leader in your, your local area just something that can that highlight the fact that you are trying to actually learn across the social media and market marketing space and sort of test and do some work, uh, you know, within that space. And it's starting to just create your knowledge base and uh, point of view uh, in that area. So nothing necessarily, I don't think there's an expectation of formality, uh, you know, especially coming in um, as a, in an early career uh, in a company in that space, but it definitely goes a long way to be able to demonstrate that you're thinking uh, in that, uh, from that perspective. Yeah, I want to elaborate on that. I, I think have demonstrating a point of view is very important. Uh, I think that is is critically important because I think a lot of people, especially just starting out, you know, especially in social media, a lot of people want that job. So how can you stand out and differentiate yourself if you don't have a strong portfolio, you don't have a lot of experience? is definitely um, providing a point of view that will be called upon in, in key moments, whether that be from, that can be from any realm, but you know, more significantly from an EDI standpoint, sometimes equity, diversity, and inclusion, you know, bringing um, a different perspective to a work group, I think can be really critical and very valued. Another thing I wanted to add to, and this can be a little, a blessing and a curse, Social media, we used to find our way into these roles by way of like, like I mentioned, my old, old paradigm, which is, you know, journalism, marketing, PR, and then you kind of find your way into it. Um, it I think that's changed a lot in that um, you don't have like your own specific skill. It, you kind of have a, a little bit of skill in everything. And what I mean by that is, um, when I'm looking to hire, it's not a mandatory, but I, I do look for as much of a unicorn as I can find. And, and that, that can be tough and that's not fair all the time, I will admit. But if you have just a, a touch of um, skills, if you're good at writing, but you also know a little design, you know, that can really help, especially if it's something just like Canva or a tool where you can create design without um, there being a high barrier of entry. Um, just having some lightweight skills in various areas can really, from a social media role, make you a very desirable candidate. Um, but, you know, you, sometimes you have to draw a line somewhere because you also don't want to promise that you'll do everything because you, you know, want to be valued as well. You don't want to be taken advantage of. So I think if you can toe that line of um, providing skills that are needed across the board from writing to design, but not necessarily uh, getting taken advantage of. I think that's a really important piece when you're setting out to start in social media. I would agree. And I wanted to just add that in terms of building a portfolio, here's the thing. So imagine that you're able to, let's say use Pinterest and make that like the platform of choice for your portfolio or use um, YouTube and have a channel like that qualifies as a portfolio, but the key is explaining your choices behind the content, the creative, I would say is really important. So no matter how you build your portfolio, explaining your portfolio to someone is going to be key to distinguishing yourself because you may have made a decision, like let's say, oh, I picked blue because it's a calming color and you know it's something that I researched from whatever. But if I look at your, your things, I'm not going to make the same conclusion. I'm not going to think you're so thoughtful. I'm just going to be like, oh, they must love blue. And that's just kind of me looking at a portfolio without a human next to me or a virtual human next to me. So understanding the why you made those choices and then understanding the how that's going to increase engagement might be something that you would want to extrapolate 
So everyone can make a good guess, just a good guess. We're not saying that you already have these like numbers based on your work. And if you've worked in an agency, what I've heard as a reason why they don't have numbers is because the clients have the numbers, but all of that can be addressed by why did you make the choices that you did in your portfolio? And then the, the next point is very simple. I want you to Google today, how do you build a portfolio? and see what pops up because I'm sure there'll be some answers there too to help get you started. Yes, absolutely. There are a lot of online examples um, from social media people, people to marketers to designers. You could always take a look at for some inspiration. Definitely, as Melissa mentioned, just make sure that it tells a narrative, you know, of your journey, you know, in social media. And like I said, why you made the choices that you decided to make in terms of the work that you did. Um, so as we've been talking about, um, we've seen a lot of shifts and changes in social media just in the past year, but just like looking like forward to the future, what does the future of social media look like in three years, like how might people be engaging with people online. Um, and yeah, maybe Tyler, you can start us, but definitely want to hear from everyone else on the panel on this topic. Sure. Um... So I have two, I have two notes. One is like content wise. I think that we're just progressively and quickly shifting to video, uh, short form video, as uh, Bria mentioned earlier, TikTok reels, uh, creating copycats of YouTube shorts, all those platforms that it's like, okay, how can we mimic what TikTok is doing and capture that audience? Because clearly it's working. Um, our attention is held with movement and stimulation and Studies are showing it, platform trends are showing it, so video. Um, and then philosophically, um, removing from content, I think the future of social media will increasingly like envelop and integrate other aspects of your life and lifestyle that previously were separate. So as an example, like shopping and news, um, those used to be kind of like separate from social media. You would go to the store, think about what shopping meant five years ago. Um, and then think about what shopping means now. Like where, where are you interacting? Where are you finding products? Where are they being served to you? Um, and then news is the same thing. What was news? What was reading the news or getting the news five years ago? And what is getting the news now? Where are you going? Um, these things are going to be folded into your social platforms and into your social lives. Um, because if there's something that you're spending time doing, these platforms are incentivized to create functionality for you to do it on their platform. And so are the brands that are providing that service to you and the institutions that are providing that service to you. So it's going to become more and more a part of your daily life and lifestyle. Yes, absolutely. Does anyone else want to um, share some thoughts on this topic? Sure. I wanted to just share this perspective, which is beyond the U.S. So thinking about social media and thinking about the future of it, my recommendation would be to look in places where you may have not looked before. So outside of your, your borders. And obviously now that we're in this more virtual world, that's easier. But really, really pay attention to what's happening outside of the U.S., because you're going to have a different perspective and you're going to be able to design the future of social media based on what's working in other places that might have maybe a more, uh, you know, a higher engaged audience naturally. Just watch for trends outside of the U.S. There was mention of Canva. The creator of Canva, Melanie, she's Australian. So check that out. <laughs> cool stuff happens outside of the US border. And there's so many things that are happening in other places and other parts of the world that it makes sense from a social media perspective for everyone to really consider like who's doing really cool stuff outside of the US and how can I follow them on Twitter, on Instagram, like follow them and then take the next step, engage with them in meaningful ways. So that, and this builds up your own skills, but so that you have your own portfolio of relationships of people 
people that are doing cool things that might be more forward looking outside of your borders. And that too would be valuable for anyone that's looking for an opportunity in social media. But again, stay tuned for what's happening outside of your local environment. And to Tyler's point, sector as well. Um, I'll probably just weigh in with one other um, 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 input here. Uh, the way that I look at um, social media and look at how technology is evolving is truly the digital, you know, sort of transformation and this balance between the physical and digital worlds of the space. So when, when we're looking at you know, sort of social media and where it can can go. It's essentially endless um, because it's a form of connecting uh, with others. It's a form of connecting um, with things that are serving, you know, or offering a purpose, you know, um, in your life, uh, whether or not that be um, consumer, you know, purchasing, you know, et cetera, or information, uh, you know, source, the source of ideas, et cetera. So that's, I'm a huge system thinker, and I feel that we are at this uh, sort of next phase of sort of our digital transformation with social media being a very interesting uh, connector of where we go. Yes, definitely. Social media really all about connection, especially in times when it's kind of hard to connect with people. Having an online space where you can do that is super important. Um, yeah, I just want to like see if there are any other thoughts on this topic or any other questions that um, we talked about before we move to questions from our uh, students who are joining us. I do see a question in the chat and I was typing to respond to it, but I can speak to it if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Tyler. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a good question. And I think, you know, when you're in college and you pick a major and you you feel like, is this limiting me? Um, you know, if I'm not a social media major or, you know, a marketing or communications major. Um, and I would say for I mean, it's a clear cut no from my perspective that it's not limiting you because as someone who's like sourcing talent and trying to hire people and find new, um, you know, find new talent um, in the social media space, like often your Twitter feed, your Instagram feed, your TikTok feed are like more uh, indicative of like your ability to do some of the job functions than your resume will be. So if you're a philosophy major, but you have a fire TikTok feed or you have, you know, built a 10,000 uh 10,000 follower Instagram account that's doing like sports content, like that's more interesting and important to me um, than, you know, your philosophy degree. If you're applying for a, um, if you're applying for a, a position in that field. So not that the philosophy degree doesn't make you a more interesting candidate because it's different. I mean, it, you might have a different perspective, but definitely like your portfolio and a lot of the things that, um, you know, Melissa and Michelle and um, Bria and Amanda have spoken to like though sharing yourself and like how you're doing that is like more important as a recruiter to me than you know your major and your academic achievement. I couldn't agree with that more. That's a hard like the answer. My answer is a hard no. Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> your uh, your portfolio is more important as mentioned. Your point of view is more important your passion, your desires, your, your goals, much more important to me than your degree, than we're the subject of your degree. And for what it's worth, I have a degree in English. So <laughs> I don't know if that was necessarily applicable to social media, but, um, you know, I think experience and portfolio is important. I will say though, Tyler, that my experience working in social media is that I don't do very much personal social media. I know I'm a rare one, but because I look at it all day for a brand, at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, I'm not selling anything. I'm not pushing anything. Like nobody wants to see pictures of my kids. 
I'm like the worst at my own personal socials. So I appreciate that reminder for myself, Tyler, that if you want to go get another job, you should probably demonstrate your abilities in a searchable way so that employers can see how good you are at it. But uh, for me, I'm like, oh, another tweet. I can't do it. <laughs> Thank you. Here. I'm also very bad at my own social media. I put more effort into my dog's social media yeah. than I run. So this, yeah, but definitely like I was a psychology major. I didn't major in journalism or marketing and I've been really successful in my career. So just to echo what everyone has said, your major is not going to be the defining factor for you. But Melissa, I saw you unmuted. Do you have some thoughts to share? Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, social media didn't exist, right? When I was picking my major. So for me, it was kind of like, well, I can't make up <laughs> what the future will look like. And so neither can we either. We don't know what's going to be in vogue, you know, 10 years from now. But what I'll say is this, whenever I've looked at resumes, let's say for 10 years, so let's say a decade worth of research, the first place I go is their college major. That's in my mind, you could be a SVP of whatever, but I'll look at your college major and then I, in my own mind, will reach the conclusion of whether you really intended to go down that field or you just ended up in that field, which usually tends to be the case. So from a college major perspective, really really do yourself a big, big, big favor and choose something that is going to be personally meaningful really, really personally meaningful. And if it happens to be practical, quote unquote, then congratulations, you figured out how to have something that's deeply meaningful and practical. If it's impractical, what I would recommend you do is simply just like get really deep in your major, enjoy it, have fun, and then figure out, especially if you're looking for a career in social media, figure out other ways to stay engaged in that space. There's nothing saying that what you learned at school has to translate in a neat fashion to what you bring to the table to an employer. When it comes to philosophy, you know, just an idea that popped up, like stoicism, like look to see all the different stoics that are in social media, obviously they're dead. So people that are fans of the stoics, but like, why not have your own like Twitter handle that's like, you know, focused on stoicism or something. Maybe I'm just thinking about Marcus Aurelius a lot, but that's just an option to you. So irrespective of your college major, the only onus that is on you is to explain why you picked that major. And if you just liked Stoics, congratulations, that's your answer. But if you have another reason, then just share the reason and then keep on moving to how that might add value to the employer, to the person with whom you're speaking, right? Maybe it gave you the critical thinking skills that no one else has in that particular department or on that team in terms of what you are able to ascertain. So just understand again, the why did you make that choice? Why? Same thing when you're walking someone through a resume. Why did I go from here to there, to there, to there, to there? And you know, people tell me the real deal. So I'll be really honest. I usually know why they really went from here to there and there. But if you're early in your career, you don't have all of that sort of story behind your resume. So you're able to just make that leap and say the reason why I went from here and the skills that I picked up from here and just kind of keep going along that trajectory. So all that to say college major doesn't matter, but I would suggest it's deeply personal and something meaningful to you. And then the second point is just figure out a way to explain your choices, explain your choices, and that's going to help you oftentimes. Absolutely. Uh, so we have another question in the chat. Um, how do I figure out what employer or job is right for me? There are a lot of social media jobs looking for interns. What makes a good one? Or should I just apply to everything? <laughs> That's the question. So who wants to jump in on this one? I can, I can jump in on this. Awesome. Um, for me, I feel like the biggest thing is networking. And I think reaching out to people 
that work in the industry or at the company that you're interested in working at and just getting a sense of the overall culture because it really is a two-way street you know it, they want you and you want them but it's all about how you guys kind of like click together and so you know do as many informationals as you can um Tyler mentioned earlier clubhouse you know listen in on those rooms those chats and then maybe reach out to people that that work in those professions that you're interested in working at and I think that'll help kind of narrow down um, what career you decide to pursue because a lot of it does boil down to, to the company culture in general. Maria, I could not agree more with you in the sense of like a, a aligning yourself with people who hold the positions you're looking for and talking to them. It's, I am well into my career and I am always finding new people to, I guess for lack of a better term, mentor me. Um, and it doesn't have to be a formal mentorship, so to speak. But I do think um, one thing I didn't do very early in my career, which I regret, is just taking some time with people who are willing to offer it. Don't be shy, right? Like people will offer help. So if you ask, if you ask for advice, if you ask um, people who have, are doing uh, what you want to be doing for, any tips or uh, usually people are happy and glad to do it. Yes, people love talking about themselves <laughs> and about their work and their careers. So please don't be afraid to reach out to people. So I have like a quick 30 minute call. I promise you they will be happy to do it. <laughs> uh, we have another really, oh, sorry, did I cut someone off? No, I would actually add one note to that is oh, okay. like, because a lot of people will, you know, you might get to, you will get to a position one day where you're like, a lot of people are reaching out and they want to schedule time. And I think the ones that stand out or the ways to like, really, I guess, like incentivize uh, the space to be made is like, is there a way that you can add value? Because I think if, you, if you're getting like 15, like, hey, can I like have virtual coffee with you? It's, um, yeah, it's just like you only have limited resources, you know, and ability to like have all of those coffee, um, virtual coffees. So if you're like, oh, I saw this and here's what I think, or here's how I can add value to something that you're doing, um, I would recommend like thinking about that and in your reach out process. Absolutely. Um, I see another really interesting question. Um, about, how, about making social media more pragmatic. Um, it's from, Cor I hope I pronounced your name, like Cor Corac, because um, currently you feel like it only serves the interest of a tiny minority. So how do we make social media more pragmatic? Um, so I can offer um, a point of view on this. Um, I think it depends on your um, definition um, of social media, um, if you expand it to include social network, um, that can actually serve even more sort of broader um, sort of uses. So I think it really um, depends ultimately what you're looking to do in terms of uh, connecting, engaging, and communicating, and what is that right platform, you know, for, for you in the uh, social media, social network sort of space, there's a broad range of different types of platforms that are serving um, different um, needs um, or um, you know a certain a certain values. So you look at platforms such as you know LinkedIn. It's much more sort of a, a social uh, network and connecting with people you know through your careers. You know versus uh, looking at you know Twitter and a Facebook and sort of Snapchat, uh, which has you know is serving a different. Um, you know, sort of um, purpose. Uh, so I think that if you look broadly across uh, it from that standpoint, I actually think that there is a, um, there's a broader, you know, applicability uh, to everyone. Yes, absolutely. Especially if you look past like the typical form of social media that we're, you know, used to like Facebook, Instagram, like Twitter, um, look at some of the ones that have recently, you know, come to the forefront, you know, like Clubhouse, TikTok, Pinterest, 
uh, Twitch, like there's so many different platforms where, you know, if you have like a particular interest, you can kind of find your niche and find your people um, and have that be like the space um, that you engage in. Um, but thank, thank you for that response, um, Michelle. Um, so we have another question. Um, so we have, what is your advice to an undocumented student uh, like myself to get, an in to get an internship in social media with a company, but not be able to due to lack of status? What other things can I do to gain experience with a company and they have a great portfolio? That question is a, a great question and it's, it's hard for me to really think through the best option for, for this person, but here's, here's the guidance I would provide. So step one, you're able to, <clears throat> you're able to get experience without a company. So that's one, right? So you have this portfolio. I'm not sure in terms of whether any of the work was tied to any organization or any um, influencer for that matter. So that's, that's one question that I have, but ultimately where I would approach this or the way that I would approach this is take advantage of the fact that right now they offer remote opportunities for a lot of things. So if I was in a situation where I had citizenship in one country, which I do, I have citizenship in the USA, but I'm physically based in Australia. So I'm not able to, well, I debate that maybe I would be able to, but I think I'm not able to, you know, knock on the doors of like my old employer, Ogilvy and Mather and say, hey, can I work here in Australia? Because I lack the citizenship here, what I would do is I would call up the US companies this is my perspective. I would call up companies in my country of origin where I do have some citizenship as an example. All of this me not knowing what that means in terms of whether things would change, you'd have to go back or whatever. So I say this with complete ignorance to that point. I would look for where can I work? For whom can I work? If I can work for organizations in my country of origin, I would call them up and I would look for remote internship opportunities. That's what I would do. Again, I am not sure how, if that is okay from a, you know, legally being able to continue to be in the place where you are. So let's just imagine that we're not okay. So there's other ways of looking at it. You might want to, instead of going after a big organization that's super competitive, you might want to look at the influencers that are on online, right? The social media people online. Influencers also need people to help them behind the scenes in terms of all of their social media creative assets. So there's other ways, other, other sources of of a brand, so to speak, that you can reach out to. So let's just imagine that you have a favorite influencer right now. So let's say for me, Gary V. So, all right, I love Gary V. And let's say that um, I'm an undocumented person, but Gary V is someone that I would love to help somehow. He might be too big because he has a big company in the US too, but let's just imagine. So reach out to them on social media, right? So understanding Gary Vee, I just told you someone that has millions of, of followers, but I was able to reach out to Gary Vee myself actually. So there, where there's a will, there's a way. All I have to say is try to think to yourself, okay, how can I reduce the barriers of entry? That's number one. Okay, I'm not a citizen here, but I'm a citizen there. Is there a way that I could reach out to companies there? Call them and do something that's remote. Another alternative would be, okay, reduce the barriers of entry. So big companies, they're gonna have a lot of rules, but maybe influencers or startups will have fewer rules. So, okay, can I come up with a list of employers that are gonna make sense for me to approach that have fewer rules? All of this, obviously you gotta do things legally, blah, blah, blah. But I'm just suggesting the same creativity that you brought to putting together your portfolio, bring that creativity to thinking about your own employers. 
same idea, just a different subject. So just think to yourself, okay, this is where I have some options. These are the other barriers. Okay, how can I overcome that barrier? And just take it line by line. This is a barrier. Okay, here's the sources of employers for me, or maybe influencers, or maybe there's a, a brand that you can just say, hey, I wanna work for you. It's complicated because whether you're paid, you're not, based on status is something I cannot address. But what, I'll, what I will say is if I've seen some of the most resilient human beings in the world, it's the people that are immigrants. So being an immigrant in and of itself, you have this like drive and sense of like just perseverance, use that in order to come up with your list of possibilities. Amazing advice, Melissa. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. Um, and yeah, and Maya, I hope that was helpful for you. And I saw that you added in your um, contact information there. So <laughs> if anyone wants to connect, uh, definitely gonna look you up on TikTok um, to see what you have going on there. Um, but yeah, we are at the near the end of our um, panel. This has been so amazing. Um, just wanna say a huge thank you to all of our panelists. Amanda, Tyler, Bria, Michelle, Melissa, thank you so much for your time, for all the great insights and perspective and advice that you shared. I really hope that everyone in attendance has learned something, that you were taking notes. Um, I know that our um, content information will be shared with you if you want to connect, like please do, as we have mentioned, like forming these connections, not being afraid to reach out, ask for advice, ask for help is really important in growing your career. Um, especially in social media and marketing. So please don't hesitate to do so. Um, I know that Michelle has also shared some additional resources and information in the chat. So please check that out. But it's just been an honor to be a moderator for this panel. And I'm just really grateful for the opportunity and hope that this was um, as beneficial and useful for all you that in attendance it was for me. Thank you. Thanks for including me. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Shaniqua. Thank you, Michelle, David, everyone at UCLA. Awesome. Um, Michelle, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Thank you for everyone for joining us today. A huge thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, your insight is awesome. I will speak on all of their behalves and say connect with them, LinkedIn them, message them if you have questions. We had um, additional questions in the chat we didn't even have time to get to. So um, if you were dying to ask, um, you know, Michelle a question or you really had an interesting inquiry for Tyler, um, please reach out to them. And we have a lot of great programs still for our Future of Work Conference. I put the link in the chat. So please um, check out the additional programs that we have available today and tomorrow. And thank you all for joining us. Hope to see you soon. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye.